Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me as a guest Dr. Craig McAllister. Dr. McAllister practices orthopedic surgery in Kirkland, Washington. He is a surgeon who specializes in complex reconstructive surgery of the hip and knee. Dr. McAllister did his medical school training at the University of Washington. He then completed an orthopedic residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. From there, he finished an orthopedic fellowship at Cleveland Clinic Foundation in reconstructive surgery of the hip and knee. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. McAllister. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. McAllister, today what I'd like to discuss is, is some of the recent advances in knee replacement. Um, knee replacements have been done in this country probably for 40 years now, mm -hmm. but the last decade has really seen a significant uh, advancement in terms of the technology and how we're really rethinking uh, when and how we do artificial knee replacements. So I guess it, it, from for the start, sort of summarize for us what the what the technology was like, say 15 years ago with artificial knee. Right. Well, one of the points that I've made before, and I always like to to make to preface this conversation, is that the the most significant phase shift as between now and the time that joint replacements started was that originally joint replacements were were reasonably crude operations that were focused on trying to help that low demand elderly patient with very severe debilitating arthritis. That has changed to where now it's, it's a much more technologically advanced surgery with much more sophisticated techniques that really now has the opportunity to focus its, its attentions on the higher demand patient who wants better range of motion, better longevity, and may not be at such end stage agony, but needs to be able to get back to work and might even want to get back to some level of recreation. So a lot of what we're going to talk about here today kind of represents that mm -hmm. change in, in, the, in the focus of joint replacement. So, so what we're talking about is, is I mean, obviously when I started, started practice, um, th there was an old adage that you don't do an artificial knee replacement on anyone mm -hmm. younger than 65, and a lot of patients right. were told that. Right. Um, we all had the, the, the misfortune, I guess, of seeing all of these patients who have either post-traumatic arthritis or, or early osteoarthritis, we had no solutions for them. That's right. Because we couldn't trust our artificial knees to really put up with hiking, biking, golfing, those sorts of things. Right, and we were left with either doing an operation that we knew wasn't really ideal for that patient right. or telling them that we couldn't help them. Yeah. And I think as the, the baby boomers have gotten into the age of arthritis, it's really pushed this effort to get to be more sophisticated and meet those needs. Those joint replacements that you and I remember from when we were first in our training or maybe even in medical school and before, they were much bulkier. More ligaments were harvested to do the operation. They required uh, stems that went up into the bone to get adequate stability. Uh, they didn't, you know, allow much in the way of range of motion, mm -hmm. but they didn't need to because they were focused on that low demand patient. In fact, really, even as late as the 1980s, some of them were really just being placed eyeball with no real instrumentation to help make sure that the alignment of the leg and that the ligament balancing was all done appropriately. Much of that has changed now with the advent of computer navigation and low profile instruments and, and, and implants that don't really take ligaments or bone uh, to do the operation. Range of motion has improved, bearing surfaces have improved. So yeah, it's a much different operation from that or origin. Well, well show, I, I guess you brought some, some uh, uh, implants to show, or at least some models. I'd be very curious at seeing the difference, and it looks like from looking at what you've got there, um, Clearly, things are changing. So yeah. demonstrate uh, for the audience what's, what's going on there. Well, first of all, as we'll talk about later, the advances go far beyond just the implants. Mm -hmm. And all these models really do is start to touch on some of the changes that have occurred in the implants. I don't really have an implant that represents the older technology that, that harvested all the ligaments. But I think some of what we have here demonstrates one of the changes, and that's going towards partial knee replacements or lower profile knee replacements. The, the most common sequence of events that I see in my office is a patient has really reached the end of their arthritis. Their medical management has failed, whether it's the hip or the knee. They've been told they need to have a joint replacement, and they're now coming for a consultation on joint replacement. So for the overwhelming majority of patients and doctors, that means they're, they're talking about this type of, of an implant, where the, for the knee, at least, the top of the tibia, on both sides of the tibia, and maybe to just to help with reference, it, it's helpful to go through some of the anatomy here. This is a knee. Here's the tibia. 
here's the femur, and as you know, this is the kneecap. So we like to think of the knee as being basically three compartments. There's the what we call the medial side, the inside of the knee, and then there's the outside of the knee, and then there's also the compartment between the kneecap and the rest of the knee. So a traditional knee replacement basically took out the damaged, worn, absent cartilage, excised part of this tibial bone, and put this plastic on top of the tibia. And then the same sort of thing is done on, the, on what we call the femoral side, where the femur is, is resected partially, in older, tib older femoral components, more bone was taken, and then this implant is put on the end of the femur. So it ends up being, today's knee replacement, quite honestly, I tell patients, is more of a resurfacing operation than it is a replacement. Mm -hmm. In older style knee replacements, they did truly take the knee out and put in a cemented, stemmed, hinged implant. Um, those are still used rarely as revision instruments, but today's first knee replacement is going to be more of this resurfacing type of operation where all but one of the ligaments is retained and, uh, and the patella, the backside of the kneecap, and the end of the femur and the tibia are resurfaced. Still easily the most common operation that's done in terms of replacement surgery. And still a good operation. And still, it is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. It's the one that certainly American surgeons have had the most experience with. They were trained to do it in their residency. Uh, the technology, the instruments, they're all accustomed to. Um, and certainly the frontline answer, even for patients with uh, limited arthritis, is still going to be the gold standard knee replacement. But realistically, there are alternatives to that full knee replacement. There are still some parts about it that patients aren't going to like. Its range of motion is not as good as a partial knee replacement. It doesn't feel as natural. The anterior cruciate ligament, one of the ligaments, is still excised to do this. So there are other alternatives for a, a reasonably, uh, I won't say small, but let's say pretty well circumscribed uh, percentage of those patients who need a knee operation, a resurfacing operation, about 12 to 15 percent of them might be appropriate for a partial knee replacement. Well, and is this partial knee replacement is this something that's always done in younger patients, or is this appropriate for an elderly patient? Well, that's a as well? good question. Um, when we're out there on the lecture circuit, we talk about a bimodal population that mm -hmm. it's appropriate for. And what, that, what we mean by that is you look at a graph of the age, you see two blips. There's the younger but still low demand patient, you know, in their 50s, they're not athletes and that sort of thing, but they have limited arthritis. They're appropriate for this. And, and their main incentive for doing it, besides that early range of motion and better feel, is going to be well. If I can do this partial as a first operation, my second operation might be this other primary total knee. So they're, they're inserting it in their sequence of events as part of their overall plan. Mm -hmm. The elderly patient is, it, it's gonna be attractive to some elderly patients because quite honestly, it's easier to tolerate the surgery. So we have fewer problems with anemia and post-operative pain. They get the range of motion back. The physical therapy is easier. Um, so it, when we're doing it in the elderly patient, we would like that to be their only operation, and we're incentivized to do it because it's just easier to get over the operation. So what you're really talking about is that, is that two things occur, two, two benefits even in an elderly uh, population or an elderly patient. One is that you're taking off less bone, you're taking off less tissue, so you're destroying right. less normal tissue right. or, or relatively normal tissue, right. tissue that doesn't have to be removed. And the other thing is, is that you're able to do this through a more minimally invasive approach so that you're making smaller incisions, again, damaging less normal tissue, putting in what's necessary, but, but not going overboard and putting in more than is necessary. So if I hear you correctly, even the elderly patient gets over the operation faster with less complications possibly um, and can tolerate that procedure better. Yeah, that, those distinctions have gotten somewhat blurred as we have uh, figured out how to take some of those minimally invasive um, elements of partial knee replacement, and now we do them with total knees. So mm -hmm. the, the discrepancy between the two has lessened. But still, the partial knee replacement is the original minimally invasive knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits, I guess, is because you're not taking off, in the younger patient especially, because you're not taking off um, as much bone, you have more to work with right. when you come back to, if that person, if this thing lasts 12 years, let's say, yes. and then they wear out the other side, the That's part right. you didn't fix, you, you've got more tissue to work with, so you, you probably get a better result from that revision. 
it's been well documented now in our literature. Originally, I'd say in the early 90s, it was somewhat controversial, but it's now well accepted that the results of changing this partial knee replacement to a primary total knee are far superior to trying to take one of these out and converting it to a revision mm -hmm. style knee replacement. Well, let's go back and try to help me with the decision-making process for patients. Yeah. Let's, let's just say we've got a patient. They're not low demand, they're not high demand. Mm -hmm. They're just a patient with an x-ray that looks like they have X amount of arthritis on their mm -hmm. knee. How do you advise that patient? How do you decide whether that knee and that patient that's right. is amenable to a partial knee replacement versus a total knee replacement. That's a very important conversation from two sides. One is, you know, if they're appropriate for the operation, then why not offer it to them? Well, one of the answers to that is because it's not just a little knee replacement, okay? The technique for doing it is considerably different and somewhat more demanding than doing actually a total knee. So. Mm -hmm you know, it's a relatively limited patient population. So number one, the surgeon needs to be comfortable with the operation. Number two, the <clears throat> on the opposite side of that is that there is this tendency uh, at times, once the surgeon is doing them, that the patients do so well, we find ourselves seduced into doing it in a lot of our patients. Mm -hmm. And we have, and our literature is very clear on this now that if the patient it was not appropriate for it, if their arthritis was not truly limited to that one compartment, one area of the knee, if their knee isn't well aligned, we, we can't do as much when we do this operation as we can when we do a total knee in terms of correcting malalignment and such. So if the patient wasn't appropriate for it, what tends to happen are early failures. And there, historically there was this feeling, well, it's okay if a partial knee fails early because it was just a little resurfacing operation. But what I counsel my patients is very clear. The only thing worse than a big operation is a little one first and then the big one shortly after right. that. And patients who, who endured that short-term failure of a partial knee replacement had to have a total knee would tell you that they just wish they'd gone to the total knee in the first place. So it's a reasonably complicated conversation, but you know, there are some pretty well accepted criteria that have to do with the patient's symptoms, their type of arthritis, how isolated the disease is to that one compartment, and um, alignment issues and other things and, and range of motion that help us to determine that, that correct 12 to 15 percent of patients who should have that smaller mm. knee. So the real risk here is, is not doing enough surgery. In, in the patient. I mean, that seems like the risk is that you choose to do what you think is a less of an operation. That's right. To the benefit of the patient, but you just, you just didn't do enough of an operation. You need to fix what's there. Right. You need to be able to fix the problem and not, as I said, get seduced into doing the smaller surgery just because it seems like it'll be easier. Well, let, let's really define for patients what the difference is. I mean, you mentioned that the, even the traditional artificial knee is becoming more and more done by minimally invasive techniques. Mm -hmm. so, so that operation in itself is getting smaller, let's say. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you've got these other options that uh, involve minimally invasive surgery and a partial knee replacement. What's the difference? I mean, for, from the patient's standpoint, hospital time, preparation, recovery time, distinguish the two. Well, and that's a, that's a, uh, a difficult topic, realistically, and I, I and I would counsel patients to be sure to talk to their surgeon and get their answers from mm -hmm. their surgeon because they will be highly variable. Just like partial knee replacement is not necessarily done by all surgeons, certainly minimally invasive surgical techniques and total knee replacement is not going to be the favored option for all surgeons. Uh, and but but. The results are increasingly, and, and we published our experience recently in a major journal that actually looked at the difference for patients after surgery comparing traditional knee replacement with a, a traditional surgical exposure to knee replacement with minimally invasive surgical techniques. And we saw a few measurable differences. And, and these were full knee replacements. Right. These were all full knee replacements. We subsequently also compared them to our uniconolar knee replacements and published that, and we can touch on that also. But what we know about uh, knee replacements, full knee replacements done with minimally invasive surgical techniques is that they can expect less post-operative pain. They still need narcotics, it's still a big operation, but it's less. They can certainly expect a smaller incision, although we don't really emphasize trying to make a tiny buttonhole incision. They can expect a better overall range of motion earlier. By a year, it probably, they will probably be very close, regardless of the technique. 
But our patients who had minimally invasive surgical techniques regained their preoperative range of motion at three months, whereas with the traditional surgery, it took a year. And a larger percentage, 12% of our patients that were done with traditional measures required significant interventions after surgery to get their range of motion, namely what we call manipulations, where we have to bend their knee for them under anesthesia. That dropped to a mere one to 2% when we went to our minimally invasive surgical techniques. Since that publication, we've introduced computer navigation, which we'll talk about in more detail later, but uh, that has also enabled us to get even smaller and more accurate with our minimally invasive surgical techniques, and it's re resulted in less blood loss. Uh, a mere 4% of our patients are transfused anymore compared to 32% with the traditional mm. techniques. So we've been able to measure less blood loss, better range of motion, less postoperative pain, and, uh, and fewer patients who need significant interventions in terms of manipulations and physical therapy after surgery. Mm. Now, any difference in how long they stayed in the hospital? Well, that's a great question. We're doing about 10 to 15 percent of our knee replacements now is outpatients. And this is the full knee replacement? Yeah, the full knee replacement. Those are our healthy, motivated patients with very good resources at home who understand that there are some benefits to not putting them, not being in the hospital for extended periods of time. And we've realized that we don't need necessarily to have all of our patients in the hospital. But our, uh, our length of stay is considerably down. You know, when you and I first started joint, doing joint replacements, it wasn't unusual for them to be in the hospital for 14 days. Yeah. We saw that drop to eight days about 12 years ago, then to four or five days about six or seven years ago. And now it's pretty routine that most even traditional protocols are three or four days in the hospital. It's unusual for our patients to spend more than one, maybe two nights in the hospital anymore. And usually if they're spending that long, in the, two nights in the hospital, it's because their resources at home may not be that good or, or we have some concerns about other issues. But uh, the, the length of stay in the hospital is highly patient dependent. It's no longer dictated by the fact that they're having a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. Now what about the partial replacements? How, is there a difference between uh, how long those patients stay in the hospital? Are you doing more and more of the partial replacements as outpatients? Yeah, what, almost what almost exclusively now. Now, again, it goes more to the patient than mm -hmm. it does the operation. If I'm doing a partial, if I'm doing an arthroscopy in a patient who's 82 with medical issues, I'm going to be pretty hesitant about sending them home. Right. Um, but let's talk about that. You know, that higher demand, more active, 50 some year old patient who doesn't have any alarming medical issues and and then as, as otherwise in reasonably good shape, I wouldn't see any reason for them to be in the hospital. Not, not in my practice, but uh, certainly not a reason, you know, some surgeons would still like to have them in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But this is definitely moving towards uh, knee replacement, uh, may at some point be almost totally an outpatient procedure. I see that as a, a reality for that healthy patient sector mm -hmm. within the next eight years. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, about the partial knee replacement. Tell me how that differs from the traditional knee replacement. I mean, what are the, the, the differences that you as a surgeon have to take into consideration when you're putting one in? Yeah. Oh, you mentioned it's, it's harder. Yeah. You mentioned that it takes more skill. Um, why? To paraphrase a comment that I made in, in a chapter that I wrote is that the the surgeon who expects to be able to use his techniques that he learned to do total knee replacements to do a partial knee replacement will be as disappointed as his patient, mm. okay? Because they are considerably different. The exposure techniques are different. We can't open up the knee as much. We retain the anterior cruciate ligament, which changes the nature of the operation. Um, some of what makes doing the partial knee replacement potentially more difficult is it is more limited in terms of the number of patients that we can do, and some of that's for technical reasons. So if, if the surgeon tries to, to do a, a knee with a significant stiffness or bad malalignment, he's going to struggle in getting that implant in. We have more freedom in terms of what we call tissue balancing with a knee replacement because we can put in different size implants and such, and we can release more ligaments. And, but whereas with the partial knee replacement, we're very limited what we can do with ligament releasing and so on. Smaller space to put our instruments in, different techniques to bring the tissues to us to do the, the surgical dissection as opposed to being able to open up the knee more widely. Yeah, it's always struck me that, the, that it's, it's easy to do the, well, relatively easy, to do a regular knee replacement because you don't have to match anything. You're in total control, like you said. With the partial knee replacement, all of a sudden you have to match. Otherwise, you get a, like a table that rocks. You get a ch or a chair mm -hmm. that rocks. You basically create a situation if you don't match what's there, 
and you get one chance to do it. If you don't match what's there, you've got a knee that rocks and it's not going to work very well. Well, and a good example of that is uh, that illustrates that is that um, partial knee replacements in our when we look at our literature, they're they're very intolerant to any malalignment. Mm -hmm. If the if the knee is left a little couple degrees one way or the other, they either wear out their plastic earlier or they wear out that other compartment earlier. Whereas total knees historically, at least in that 10 or 15 year zone, have been relatively um, bulletproof in terms of a few degrees off, as it were, because everything's been resurfaced. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I honestly believe that the our parameters are more exacting, our ability to expose the knee is more limited, and since only 12 or 15 percent of patients are appropriate for it, the reality, as you and I both know, is that a reasonable number of these surger surgeries are done by surgeons who are doing 10, 15, 20, 30 a year. Well, if only 12 percent are appropriate for a uni, then that means they may have the opportunity to only do one or two of these a year. So there's a volume issue in terms of the experience. So they're just out of practice. They should not Probably surgeons that aren't focused on that or focused on reconstructive surgery probably aren't getting enough practice to actually... Or opportunities. Yeah. And do. as I pointed out, this is still the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So if a surgeon is comfortable with this and it's a good operation for the patient, you know, as you know, we train a lot of surgeons at our center in joint replacement and, and we train them on minimally invasive techniques, including unicondylar knee replacements. I bet a reasonable number of those surgeons come look at the technique and say, you know, I've just decided that's not for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go home and I'm still going to do my total needs of my patients. If they want something else, I'll send them to somebody else. And to me, that's the gold standard of surgical decision making, just like this is the gold standard of knee replacement. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see those surgeons do a traditional total knee that they're comfortable with than try to force a partial knee replacement. Well, I think I, think I understand the difference a little better now. One thing that I still don't understand is the, the role of computer-guided navigation and how this has, I think I understand, how it's driven uh, the acceptance of these uh, more minimally invasive, more accurate knee replacements, yeah. whether it's the total or the, the partial. But describe that for us. I mean, what is this new concept of, of computer-guided navigation? How does it work and how is it making this possible? Well. That's some great points there, and I want to touch on a few of them, but let's just first try to put computer navigation in simple terms. Um, people have compared it to the navigation systems in your car. Mm -hmm. When you're in a town that you don't know that well, how, how comforting it is to know where you're going. To airplane uh, landing and having a computer that helps the pilot know where he is. Well, let's compare and contrast that to knee surgery. Now, historically, when you and I trained, it was taking a rod and putting it up a bone or taking a, an apparatus and laying it on the leg and trying to eyeball our implants. And, and then we would look at the leg and try to decide if it was well aligned. And basically when we use those techniques, the gold standard has been that if we could get 70% of our knees within five to seven degrees of ideal alignment, we thought we were doing a pretty good job. That was just the standard. Mm -hmm. Well, computer navigation in one way or another, and there are multiple different technologies for this, but in one way or another, what we're doing is we're putting sensors on the, the thigh bone and the shin bone, the tibia and the femur, and we're letting those sensors communicate with a PC, a personal computer in the room. And then we're taking a, a pointer and we're touching different parts of the leg and recreating a live, real-time feedback, digital image of every step that we do in the operating room. So we get confirmation that everything that we do is precise. That does two things. One, it makes our implant position and alignment more accurate. Two, because we're using a small probe hooked up to a sensor, we simply don't need as much as ex exposure as we used to need with those bigger instruments. And we don't have to put rods up the femur, and so we've improved in terms of blood loss and post-operative pain issues. What that has done practically is created a new gold standard. Instead of saying, well, we get 70% of our knees within five to seven degrees, now the gold standard is 95% to 98% within three degrees. Is that going to be something that a patient notices? No, not for the most part. But recent literature has shown that, that knees that are within three degrees of appropriate alignment have an 11-fold have a, um, an lower chance of needing a revision by 15 years. So the bottom line is they last longer. It's one of... The, it's one of the things that will promote a longer lasting knee. Mm -hmm. There are other things as well, but we now have the opportunity to consistently dial in our knees with better implant positioning, better overall alignment with, and requiring less exposure.
So rather than using what we used to use, basically looking at the knee and, and different types of jigs, the same way you would uh, build a piece of furniture or something like that, you sort of attach something to the knee that you use to hold the saw while you cut it. Now we're using the computer to get better, more accurate alignment cuts and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and you're expecting that to, 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 to one, make the surgery more accurate, but, but also you don't have to see anymore, so you don't have to open that knee up don't, and see. Don't require as much exposure. Um, you're using the computer to see for you. Mm -hmm. And using your analogy, it's sort of like uh, if, you're, if you're only 70% accurate, that means that your airplane's only landing in the clouds with about 70% of the wheels on the runways 70% uh, of the time. Now we're landing on the runway all wheels all the time, or at least 98% of the time. Right. And the big advantage is lower blood loss, less tissue damage, more accurate knee that lasts longer. Yes. And I think you also mentioned uh, a couple other things. One is that you feel like that accuracy gives us a knee that functions better. Not just longer, but functions better. Better, better range of motion, more stable, and that accuracy is so important for the partial knee, especially. Well, it's certainly having an impact on our, on our partial knee replacements as well. Uh, but as you're, as you're kind of touching on, the really, realistically, I simplified what computer navigation does. It also lets us look at our ligament balancing and component rotation that has, and those things have an issue, uh, an impact on immediate post-op range of motion and how solid that knee feels in spite of the fact that it's got a good range of motion. So mm -hmm. there have been a litany of other um, it was, it was significant and important advantages to computer navigation. Well, how, how widespread is this computer navigation? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this something that uh, surgeons are just sort of adopting willy-nilly, or is it everybody wants one, or yeah. where are we today? Well, that's a, a really good question. Um, the, re the realistic truth there is that computer navigation really came onto the scene around 2004. Computer na navigation represents a significant uh, change in surgical technique. Imagine a pilot who's been used to flying visual and using his senses and his feel of the airplane, who now all of a sudden is told no one wants to use a computer. And in fact, now that you're using the computer, you don't need a window. Mm -hmm. and, and we want you to do it through less exposure. Um, it, or another analogy I've made, imagine somebody wanted you to do your golf swing just using a computer instead of the feel. It, it's, it can be a significant learning curve for the surgeon and the staff. Because it involves a computer, it's much more oriented towards an entire room that knows what's going on. The assistant has to have a more active involvement. So the, the day when an orthopedic surgeon who wants to do a computer, minimally invasive knee replacement could just call up Dr. Joe and say, can you help me with a knee tomorrow is gone. Mm -hmm. So it, it really does sort of um, challenge the learning curve of the surgeon, the hospital staff, and everyone else involved. The other barrier is quite honestly, it's very pricey. It's very expensive. A standard computer unit runs somewhere between $150,000 and $300,000. So uh, particularly in this era when payers and the government is wanting to pay less and less for these surgeries, it's a significant barrier for the hospital to acquire these units. So realistically, you know, I, I've really spent the last four or five years kind of lecturing on this and going to meetings. And just to illustrate the change, five years ago when I asked the audience, how many surgeons here, audience of 500 surgeons, how many of you are navigating, you'd see one or two willing to raise his hand. Four years ago, it was 10. Three years ago, it was a third of the audience had at least tried computer navigation. Two years ago, people were afraid to admit they weren't doing it. Mm. And, but that's total joint surgeons. That's 500 joint replacement surgeons. So it would be even a smaller percentage today who are, who are actively navigating most of their total knees. And it sounds like this is destined to sort of be mm -hmm. the standard of care at some point. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other benefits to the, to the computer navigation that we, we haven't discussed? I mean, anything mm -hmm. in terms of, of operative time or uh, any of the other things that we typically look for to try to decide whether this is a, a net gain or a net loss? Well, certainly early in the experience, if anything, from an operative time point of view, most surgeons would tell you it's a disadvantage because they got their learning curve going on. So right? it takes longer for them yeah. to do a case for, until they get for, used to it. For me it. now, it's about a five-minute add-on. So it, it, but one of the reasons why it takes a little bit more time is because you actually catch mistakes and you fix them. Mm -hmm. So you know, some of those are good minutes <laughs> that you're adding. The other big advantage, though, of computer navigation is a, is a teaching tool for medical students. We're setting up a computer navigation learning lab at the University of Washington in conjunction with our artificial teaching knee that's 
and, and our emphasis is going to be, okay, so what are the best teaching modalities so that a resident or a, a surgeon that's learning techniques can reproducibly get the results that we think they're getting and the computer navigation is going to be our evaluation tool. So we, we believe that from a teaching point of view, it's going to help us again set a new gold standard. Well, it, it sounds like that, that clearly the minimally invasive uh, approach and especially using the computer guided navigation it is, it has, has made a huge difference in terms of, of how we as surgeons look at, at total knee replacement now. And I guess the question always comes up, something surgeons don't like to talk about a lot, but that is complications. Right. Is there any downsides to the artificial knee? I think you mentioned one, if, if you don't do the right operation, it may fail. But any, any specific complications that patients should know about with partial uh, knee replacements versus the traditional one? Well, and, and that list of complications is changing as time goes on. <clears throat> some new ones and some old ones that are going away. Uh, we mentioned one that's a real common one, which is a stiff knee after surgery. I'd say, particularly with the knee replacements, uh, where patients really need a certain range of motion in order to be comfortable and happy, if they don't get it, that's a complication. And if they require other surgical interventions, such as a manipulation, we consider that a complication of surgery. So with the Traditional technique, we were seeing that in 10 to 12 percent of our patients, but with MIS techniques, we've seen that particular complication uh, come down and range of motion improve. There are other less common complications that I think any surgeon who's going to offer a knee replacement or hip replacement will cover with patients, and that list can get long and, and dreary to go through, but in, as a group or as groups, there are medical complications. Certainly, this is, can be an elderly patient population who are predisposed to heart disease, uh, vascular disease, and strokes. They might have uh, uh, kidney problems and lung problems and have issues with pneumonias and uh, other what we consider medical complications. Another group of common complications would be related to the fact they're having anesthesia, postoperative pain, uh, confusion. Um, maybe reactions to the actual anesthetic itself, and it's very common, really. I'd say 8, 12 percent of our patients have some type of minor medical complication like a reaction to a medicine, a rash, or they get nausea or vomiting after the surgery, and, and those are all important things to discuss with the patient, even though patients may not see those as complications, we do. Mm -hmm. When we published our series of 200 knees, our compl uh, 200 knee replacements, 100 done with the traditional method, 100 done with the minimally invasive surgical technique. And in terms of complications, the difference was the manipulation rate. Only one of our patients with the MIS technique needed a manipulation, whereas 13 of the, of the traditional needed it. Um, but otherwise, the complication rate was 2% in the whole group. Of the 200 patients, we only saw four patients with complications, and they were a heart attack, in one patient. Two patients had clots that didn't result in any significant problems, but we considered those complications. And one patient had um, a pneumonia after surgery. So that's a reasonably small complication rate, but it's still very real if, if it's you that has the complication, mm. and patients need to know that. Well, a couple, you, you mentioned the blood clots, and I think what you're talking about is, is uh, deep venous thrombosis or right. thrombophlebitis sometimes, mm -hmm. which is, you know, used to be a, an almost universal complication that's of total right. knee replacement. Um, what about infection? Do you think that we're going to, to see even a lower infection rate? I mean, obviously, infection rate is very low in artificial joints, but my assumption would be that as we do minimally invasive procedures with less tissue damage, less bleeding, that our infection mm -hmm. rate should, in fact, go down. Well, that's, that's a very reasonable hope. Um, <clears throat> infection rates are, are a moving target. They, they are different. Uh, in any point in time, we know from data that uh, infection rates can be higher in one institution than another, depending on how they handle their traffic and how old the rooms are and so on and so forth. Different parts of the country have different infection rates. Um, there's a, a certain mass effect of a hospital doing at least 100 a year. If it's below that, then their infection rates are a little bit higher. Uh, the, nationwide, the infection rate runs between 1 and 2% of hip and primary, first time hip and knee replacements, but it can get up to three or four percent at various institutions. But I think it's also a, a moving target in time. Um, as uh, one example would be this resurgence now of resistant organisms, and, I, and particularly people hear a lot about MRSA and methicillin-resistant staph and other resistant organisms with the widespread use of antibiotics. So 
Um, as we reflect back on our discussion about outpatient knee replacements, the sooner we can get patient, patients out of the hospital and out of that environment where patients who have those infections just exist, then I think that has a real positive impact on the potential for infections. It would be a good example of where minimally invasive surgical techniques offer an opportunity to avoid a complication. So, so un, uh, hospitals are all, have always been thought of as a place you go to catch, in the old days, you go to catch diseases, um, and we're beginning to see that at this point. So your point is, is that if we can do these operations as an outpatient, we may actually reduce our, our infection rate, not because the, of minimally invasive techniques, but because people aren't going into the hospital. Well, I would never want to scare patients of being in the hospital, nor would I want to encourage outpatient knee replacement in, in a setting where it's not appropriate. But what I do tell patients is uh, I like to get them to think of a, of a graph where the, the one line demonstrates or illustrates the risk of leaving the hospital too soon. Mm -hmm. And that, that line goes down very quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, with minimally invasive surgical techniques, certainly by 8 hours or 12 hours or 24 hours, the risk of sending a patient home too soon is dropping precipitously. But as the hospitalization progresses, especially if it progresses beyond what the patient really needs to be, you know, needs for his hospitalization, pretty soon the risk of being in the hospital starts increasing. An example would be an IV, an intravenous line that stays in longer than it needs to be, um, increasing exposure to other patients that have infections, um, communication errors between one nurse and the next, and medication errors that are characteristically you know, more, more probable the longer the patient's in the hospital. So what we counsel our patients is, that there's a time when the risk of being in the hospital is going down and the risk of, or rather the, the risk of going home is going down and the risk of being in the hospital is going up and that's what we want them to go home, right at that moment. Okay. Good and MIS advice. techniques are helping us in that regard. Well, as, as, as you look back on our discussion this morning, tell me a little bit about um, whether there's anything that we have not covered that you think patients need to know about new technologies with, with artificial knees, and especially should they be seeking out surgeons that are using yeah. uh, computer navigation? Should they be seeking out surgeons that uh, are doing these minimally invasive techniques and the partial knee replacements? What's your advice? Well, that's a, that's a double-edged sword, I believe. I think that these technologies, particularly minimally invasive surgical technique and computer navigation, offer some potential benefits. Is it worth leaving your hometown to go to another surgeon just for those technologies? Maybe not. If it's a, if it's a solid, experienced orthopedic surgeon who's counseling to do this traditional total knee with traditional measures, one of the things I pointed out in our study was that at one year, some of the benefits, a good number of the benefits that we saw were, were gone and they were equal with the traditional measures. And, you know, a trusted orthopedic surgeon in your community who's going to be there for you at post-op week 6 and 12 and so on and so forth is not, not an asset I would walk away from lightly. Like on the opposite side of that coin, I just point out these are significant learning curves. I don't think that most patients really want to be part of that surgeon's learning curve. And if you're pushing the surgeon to do techniques that he's not necessarily comfortable with, you might find yourself part of his learning curve. And I don't think that's really what most patients want, nor should they seek it. On the other hand, if you're a, 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 you know, a high-demand patient who needs range of motion and needs to get back to work and you have the means to, to seek out that physician, certainly that's, that's what's happening today. Patients are going to the Internet. They're doing their research. The only thing I would counsel patients is use the Internet to, to help you phrase your questions but go to a trusted counselor and physician for the answers. Well, thanks. I think that's good advice for anybody. Um, appreciate the good information. Um, I think that um, I think patients should get a lot out of this, and um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.